Spaceballs the movie was released in an era when parody films were very much at the height of popularity. The movie was a loving satire of the science fiction genre in general, and Star Wars in particular. Mel Brooks was very active in the parody space during his time as a movie maker, and he lampooned monster movies, westerns, and medieval fantasy films, just to name a few. A viewer watching Spaceballs today might find the humor tame and predictable, like the silly bumper stickers and license plates, or the questionable Druish jokes. That's all we needed. A Druish princess. Funny. She doesn't look Druish. But this film was made as a loving satire rather than a biting critique. Which, for me, explains why I feel like Mel Brooks appeared to use kid gloves when spoofing the subject matter. Movies in the 80s did not shy away from profanity, violence, or nudity, and yet Mel managed to keep this movie mostly family-friendly, or at least as clean as an 80s audience would allow. In the movie, the yogurt character, which is a riff on Yoda, tells Lone Star, played by Bill Pullman, that they might see each other again in the sequel, Spaceballs 2, The Search for More Money. This title was a wink, I believe, at Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. Rick Moranis said during an interview that the next film should be called Spaceballs 3, The Search for Spaceballs 2. Given the amount of time that has passed, I think that is quite a funny and fitting title. Some years ago, posters began to appear in New York advertising Spaceballs 2 but this turned out to be a hoax perpetuated by an ardent fan. Okay, so back to sequel baiting. Are there enough threads from the original to weave a sequel? Analysis? Engage. A good sequel will answer questions raised by the first film. Identifying some of the important questions will give us the bones of a logical sequel. And since checklists are fun, let's do that. Who are Lone Star's parents? Did Planet Spaceball eventually run out of air? Is there a specific reason they are searching for more money? Who was Dark Helmet's roommate? Obviously, this is a comedy, but as we do on this channel, we will treat all information as being true. The key to all of these questions is Dark Helmet. Before their duel, Dark Helmet and Lone Star have the following exchange. I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's, former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing! From this declaration, we learned that Dark Helmet knows who Lone Star's family is, at least on his father's side. At one point, Mel Brooks said that a sequel would never be made after John Candy passed away, which is a shame that the sequel wasn't made sooner. For the sake of this video, I'm choosing to forecast the sequel film events as happening directly after the first film. In keeping with our ethos here at Cannon Fodder, we don't do fan fiction. We do forecast the causal trajectory of characters and events. That means we don't invent new characters, settings, or events. We don't write dialogue or kill off characters. In light of the questions posed, I will attempt to weave together a logical starting point for Spaceballs 2, the search for more money. Let's begin. With the destruction of the transforming ship Spaceball 1, and the unknown whereabouts of President Scroob and Dark Helmet, the orb cities of Planet Spaceball have disbanded. All the financial resources of Planet Spaceball were invested in the creation of Spaceball 1, on the gamble that all of Planet Druidia's air would be brought back to Planet Spaceball. As it stands, Planet Spaceball is bankrupt and cannot even import cans of Druidian Perrier. The death of Pizza the Hut has many interested parties searching the galaxy for his rumored hoard of space bucks. Planet Druidia is also in need of money. King Roland has been as frugal as any Druish father but the loss of Princess Vespa's Mercedes and the cost of her two royal weddings have put a strain on the coffers. Now, with the cities of Planet Spaceball broke and disbanded, the largest importer of Druidian Perrier is now gone. King Roland has heard the rumors of Pizza the Hut and his hidden stockpile of space bucks on an uncharted planet. The king asked Lone Star and Vespa to take up the search for more money. 
Once more, Lone Star, Vespa, Barf, and Dot enter the Eagle Five and set a course for the Moon of Vega to consult with Yogurt. A city orb appears in the skies over the planet of the apes. A ship departs from the orb and lands on the beach beside the crushed head of the Mega Maid. The ramp of the ship opens and a squad of spaceball troopers disembark and form two lines flanking the ramp. A tall woman strides down the ramp and calls out to the large metallic head. She calls out for President Scroob and identifies herself as Commander at Zircon. From the base of the head, three disheveled men with long beards and tattered clothes hobble toward the commanderette. She tells them that the distress beacon in the maid's head was how they were able to find them. From the appearance of Scroob, Helmet, and Sanders, they have been marooned for years with minimal resources. Scroob asks the commanderette, how long it has been since the Mega Maid was destroyed. She tells him that Mega Maid was destroyed only three weeks ago. Scroob, Helmet, and Sanders accompany Zircon and depart the Planet of the Apes. Zircon provides Scroob with the current state of the galaxy, and Scroob informs all parties that they will also commence the search for more money. At this point, we have our inciting incident, and the characters are set on the same goal, which will converge in conflict. The evidence I've examined and the forecasting presented are the most logical continuation of events. Anything I write past this point would by necessity delve into the speculative and then the creative, but that isn't the focus of this channel. As with any of my other analysis videos, if my viewers are interested in a part two for any of my content, please let me know. Now it's suggestion time. If I had a chance to present a script to Mel Brooks, then some of my additions would be as follows. I would include a Boba Fett caricature. Accordion music plays as we are introduced to her. We see a woman wearing a beret, smoking a cigarette. Her name is Bonafet, and she is a French-Canadian bounty hunter from the planet Poutine, and her spaceship, Le Bonjour, is shaped like a canoe. Dark Helmet finds the ring of the Schwartz and learns to use the upside of the Schwartz. As stated earlier, Dark Helmet knows who Lone Star's father, uncle, and at least two cousins are. Certainly a sequel movie should fill in these details. As for more money, if I were writing the gag, I'd make more money the name of a person, and not just anybody, but Dark Helmet's former roommate, making them related to Lone Star. I like to think that More Money and Dark Helmet were roommates at the Academy of Schwartz Sensitives, or ASS. More Money was a freethinker and nonconformist, so he, or she, rebelled against the dogmatic teaching of only a Schwartz upside or downside, and discovered the flip side. More Money would meet Lone Star and teach him the ways of the flip side. I think that the heroes and villains reach the Horde. They will discover that Pizza the Hut is not dead. But that Pizza the Hut had racked up millions of space bucks worth of debt, so he faked his own death to avoid paying back any money and then collected on his own life insurance policy. I would have Lone Star, More Money, and Dark Helmet get into a duel. Dark Helmet would strike down More Money, and Lone Star would take up the flip side ring, and fight helmet. In the skies above, the rest of the spaceball orb cities arrive. Troop ships land on the planet's surface. Lone Star and friends are captured, and the movie ends on a to-be-continued. Did you enjoy my analysis? Let me know in the comment section below. If you haven't done so already, please consider becoming a subscriber. Until next time. Who is he? He's an asshole, sir. I know that.